Welcome to my docu-series on the 1959 Fender Deluxe Tweed version. Today I'm going to talk about the face splitter signal distortion. Other issues I'm going to address. Uh, the input signal saturation voltage limit, the signal kink at the bias point, setting the bias in general terms, and then my last slide I'm going to talk about extreme overdrive overheating harmonics. This is where I'm Focused today is on this phase splitter or phase inverter, depending on which camp you hail from. I want to point out a typo from the last video. It's this pin here. When I was testing the mains at 110 volts, this voltage is 28.7, not 51, as I showed in the last video. I've updated the comments in the last video to reflect this, just to point out there was a typo. I said there might be one. I found it while recording this video. So it's 28.7, not 51. Just wanted to bring that to your attention. The power tubes. So here's the, this is a cathode driven and plate driven and, or anode driven. And I, the designation is because of the phase splitter. The plate of the phase splitter drives this tube. The cathode of the phase splitter drives this other tube. So if you're working from the wiring diagram, this is how I traced it out to get you, so I could hook up my oscilloscope today and uh, get you the images I'm gonna show you in this video. So for references, this power tube I'm going to refer to as anode driven because it's driven by the signal from the anode of the phase splitter. And this power tube is going, I'm going to refer to as cathode driven because it's driven from the signal from the cathode side of the phase splitter. The phase splitter has a uh, load on both the plate and the cathode have to be identical. If there are, are if the loading is identical, which is set by these resistors, 220K here and here, then you should expect both the anode and the cathode signal to be the same amplitude and get this is 180 degrees out of phase with one another. This is what you want. This only exists up until you hit the saturation limit uh, for the amp for the signal, which is around 100 millivolts generally, but for this amp, it's not, this particular amp that I have in my shop is 90 millivolts. So what happens when we start overdriving? We start going, oh, pushing the signal above the saturation limit. We get a dimple. So this wave, as you see on the screen, I denoted A for anode driven, K for cathode driven, at 100 millivolts, we start. You'll start seeing this is actually a little bit more than 100 millivolts. But I need to show you at that uh, point, you get this dimple show up. It gets more pronounced when the input signal increases. The dimple gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Actually, it gets wider, wider, and wider. It the amplitude is the same. The amplitude on the anode from uh, top to bottom is the same amplitude for the cathode from bottom to top. The width, as you'll notice here, that it, the signal's coming down, you'll see a, a harsh break here and here. It's the same width as the flat spot of the cathode. What's occurring is the cathode still provides feedback to the grid to the uh, 12AX7. So the cathode has gone into grid clamp. It will, and both are in grid clamp, but the cathode is in grid clamp and it's also allowing the, the anode to uh, attempt to increase in amplitude, but the amplitude doesn't actually increase. It's providing a bit of feedback and the width of this dimple is the width of the flat spot on the cathode signal. So here's a little wider. It's the same width here. It's the same, it's a little wider here. It gets really wider when I take it to 250 millivolts. Amplitude doesn't increase any, but, or much if any. 
there's a little bit of increase from here to there, but the width from this point to that point is the same width as here. So there's a couple things going here, on here. Amplitude is not increasing significantly, but the dimple width is. This interferes. If this dimple actually was being processed by the push-pull tubes, we would have a problem with this, an additional problem with the distortion at this point. However, the only pro signal that's being processed is the positive going signal on both the anode and the cathode. And we combine them together, this is what we, you end up with. This is the input signal to the output transformer. Then the output transformer is the signal out of that goes to the speaker, which is 180 degrees to the input of the output transformer. And this is the signal at the speaker. The narrower part of the cathode wave, you can see in the bottom image, and the wider part is the anode positive going signal, as you can see here in the speaker. Notice how the wavelength uh, width of the flat spot is the same. This is the anode going, positive going, this is the cathode going. I left the anode in here to show you that they, the width is the same as the flat spot on the speaker, which is the flat spot of the cathode. The dimple doesn't enter into this, and you're going, okay, great. So the good news is the dimple is really a non-issue. So we just have to deal with amplitude and a moderate amount of clipping, from soft clipping, which is slightly rounded, to hard clipping, which becomes a little bit more flat on the top. This is the bias kink, which is the next subject that's of importance. At saturation, both the signals look symmetrical, and the kink is relatively smooth through there. It's flat. We, if you're going to adjust the bias point of the push-pull amp, probably not this one because they're combined, but any push-pull amp, you want to set the input signal to give you the saturation limit for the push-pull amp, and that should be a smooth transition. If it's not a smooth transition, that is when, and only when, you adjust the bias setting for either uh, of the power tubes. At the other hand, when the tube is amp is set into distortion, you overdrive the saturation signal, the bias point becomes kinked. This is not when you adjust the bias point for either power tube because you're, it, it's, it's not when you do it because you're, you're chasing a problem by introducing another problem. We want to limit the amp, a push-pull amp to the saturation signal to adjust, if necessary, the bias point for either power tube. It, when we push it heavily distorted, that bias point is, forms a kink. It's not the tube it's not a tetrode causing this kink, because it, even though these are can be considered as tetrodes, whole another subject for another day. I'm trying to get around patent infringements and the, and the like, and the other patent wars, and either pentode or a tetrode. It's that's a whole another conversation. But just leave it at that. The, this is a bias point kink due to overdriving the amp, overdriving the saturation. Uh, limit. So that's what this is about. It's a nice S curve at that point. So it just becomes progressively worse as you start increasing the distortion level of the amp. So what happens if we overdrive this further? Let's go to an extreme. We're going. I take the signal to 500 at 500 millivolts and above. This is what you get. So here's the anode signal. I'll let that overlay with the signal to the speaker. The speaker, a signal is, for all intents and purposes, a square wave, as is the uh, anode-driven signal. It's a square wave. A square wave does not allow the either power tube or the output transformer to have a cooling cycle. When you have a an amp up to saturation limit on both, so the amp is 
the power tube is being driven, but it also has a cooling cycle because it cuts off. Okay, the bias point cuts off a negative going thing. It allows the tube to cool down through half a cycle. But at this point, neither cycle, positive or negative going, is allowing that tube to actually adequately cool. In fact, when it is on, it's on the whole time. The area in the curve has really become huge. The tubes and the output transformer overheat. At this point, whether it's 500 millivolts or more, the odd harmonics become very harsh, as you can see on screen. I have software where I can pull the waveforms out. I stick it into a Fourier transform and I do my analysis there for those of you who have asked before about that. So the second harmonics I'm not too worried about. We never are. It's the harsh ones. Look at the third harmonic. When you start going into a square wave, third harmonic becomes 4%. Fifth harmonic becomes almost 7%. And the seventh harmonic is 3%. This is really a harsh sound. So that's all I have on the face splitter signal distortion. I hope you found this useful. Thank you for watching.